speaker for today mr r gopala krishnan vice president shohas secretary mihir bhai friends seniors and my online viewers good evening and a very warm welcome to all of you to this lecture meeting on the topic institutional building and corporate ayurveda first and foremost thing let me thank mr r gopala krishnan to find time and agreeing you know in, in you know accepting our invitation and agreeing to address our members a big thank you sir uh sir uh, before i go on i would like to introduce our institution to you our institution was formed in the nine, in, in the year 1949 and it is 70 years old young and over the 70 years it has become the leading organization for voluntary chartered accountants uh, as i would always like to say that it is a association or it's an institution for the chartered accountants by the chartered accountants and for the chartered accountants because it is a voluntary organization and all the people in this particular institution work purely on a voluntary basis uh sir over the past 70 years this organization has built up a repute for itself it is known for its ethical practices one it is known for its innovativeness second because you know we always try to be innovative and try to find out new programs and new education initiatives and thirdly because of the quality of its program uh, uh our education programs are well accepted and well known to each and every member of uh, our uh, even uh, the society also and membership at large uh, uh so uh, besides our education programs we are also very well known for our publications and uh, we come out with regular publications on uh, technical and non technical subjects uh so we would like to tell you that we have you know our bombay chartered accountant society journal is a prize publication from us and since the past 51 years month by month every 12 months this issue comes out and we just celebrated our golden jubilee of this of this publication last year and we had uh, golden pages where we took interviews of you know personalities such as mr y h malegam zia modi uh, rakesh junjunwala mr ishat hussain uh, mr narayan murthy and sir in march 2019 in the book review also a review of your book uh, crash lessons from entry and exits of CEO, ceos was there and i would like to present this uh, journal to you um sir uh, our constitution only allows chartered accountants to be members so therefore in a way our hands are tied that we cannot take non chartered accountants as members but for non chartered accountants and students we have a, a, a social media platform and currently we have about 9000 plus members and 31000 strong social media followers on all the four social media platforms uh, linkedin uh, face uh, facebook uh, youtube and um, uh, sorry no no i mean twitter twitter sorry sorry twitter and sir uh, i would urge all of you all to follow us on bcas global uh, handle uh, and all our lecture meetings like this ex example this lecture meeting is uh, telecasted live to go and visit all our lecture meetings which are available free of cost now coming uh, to today's topic uh, friends institutions are generally referred to as an organization founded for a religious educational professional or a social purpose institutions are organizations which are driven by values behavior way of thinking or philosophy of the set of individuals within the community or within that organization at times institutions are also referred to as a mechanism of social interactions it was said that rome was not built in one day it always takes a time for creating something monumental one needs to be committed to the cause and be patient to have big achievement great institutions are not built overnight rather it is a tireless journey evolved over time and takes ages of hard work practice and perseverance to succeed this gives rise to a lot of questions for today's topic i'm sure most of you all are awaiting uh, 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 you know what uh, mr r gopala krishnan is going to speak so what is business institution what are business institutions and for whom are they critical what do business institutions do what are what can companies learn from business institutions 
is there a difference between a leader and shaper that is excellent business leaders as against shapers of business institutions how can india train and develop more institution institution builders rather than just excellent business leaders can growth coexist with long life can corporate ambitions be made competitive along with long life how can companies stay young happy and enjoy a long life is there some sort of a mantra or a formula or a corporate ayurveda for the solution either in part or in full to address all this today we have uh, uh, the speaker and it is a pleasure to formally introduce uh, the speaker today mr al gopalakrishnan a thorough professional a business advisor prolific speaker ardent writer and an inspiring teacher these are the few words that can you know sum up his uh, introduction uh mr r gopala krishnan has been a professional manager since 1969 before me, including me before any of our birth he has served as a chairman of unilever arabia and M md of brookborn lipton and vice chairman of hindustan lever he was also a director on the tata sons and several tata group companies he also serves as an independent director and non executive chairman of castrol india he is an independent director in hermes holding uh plc sri lanka and he also mentors many many uh, startups speaking he is an international speaker and is actively engaged in both institutional and inspiring speaking he has to his credit more than 100 keynote addresses having spoken in international and national conferences writing he is a regular communist uh, columnist with several financial newspapers including the business standard and since 2007 has authored nine management books which have been best sellers teaching he serves as an executive in residence in sp jain institute of management and research mumbai and is a distinguished professor with iit kharagpur Statist statistically speaking sorry he has over 52 years of management experience with 32 years experience only of board with over 100 keynote addresses in india and abroad and authored nine management books and numerous numbers uh, of uh, articles so i again once again thank you very much to spend your valuable time with us and agreeing to address our member but before i hand over the mic to him i would just request our vice president suhas to hand over a small token of our remembrance of the evening spent with us <laughs> ladies and gentlemen mr r gopalakrishnan thank you thank you very much manish bhai and to suhas and uh, mr mihir uh, for your very warm welcome you handed over that uh, uh, little gift saying it's in my remembrance i'm very close to chandanwadi so i don't want to be <laughs> using the word remembrance please say it's a token <laughs> for the future i mean we all have to get there some day and i'm not even carrying my aadhar card if i go to chandanwadi they won't let me in you know. so i must be careful thank you <clears throat> for inviting me here uh, i'm the son of a chartered accountant and the brother of a chartered accountant but i'm not a chartered accountant so my father and my brother who's older to me used to say ki you're doing some faltu studies this is a really um, top profession i said some day i'll sneak in today i have accomplished that thank you uh i have chosen a subject today which has uh, helped me to be reflective you said i started my career in 1969 i actually started in 67 so that's 52 years i know that makes me look as though i started my career before half of you were born i don't know if it's half or whatever number there are many ways to introduce a person one is to say all the nice things that you said the second way is to say when he was born 
Mahatma Gandhi and Muhammad Ali Jinnah were walking in the streets of Bombay and Lord Wavell was ruling in Delhi, uh, which is also factually true by the way. I'm a pre-independence uh, born. I would like to believe I'm uh, born long ago, but I'm not irrelevant. And I spent 31 years in uh, Unilever and almost 19 years in Tata. And I thought I should start my third career of reflecting about what are the lessons I have learned, what are the questions that are unanswered. And that is why I am now in this third stage of my career. <coughs> and I am taking the liberty of sharing with uh, an enlightened audience some of the issues that are engaging my mind right now. I'd like to share my thoughts and I'll be enriched if you have any comments or agreement, disagreement or embellishment. I have been long struck by the subject of building institutions. You define institutions in a particular way. But very often in the newspaper, people will say the democratic institutions are being enhanced or damaged as the case may be. And we use the word institution in connection with the music sabhas and uh, management colleges and engineering colleges. So I want to first spend some time addressing what does institution mean and what does institution building mean. I have contracted it to IB, I know it sounds like Intelligence Bureau, but uh, in the interest of uh, uh, using shorter forms, uh, I keep saying IB, don't mistake me for the other instrument that is used by uh, governments. And why is it important for us to think about this subject of institution building? That's the first question. So there are only three questions I'm going to answer. The second one is, what do institution builders do? How do they build institutions? And what can we learn from them? And the third subject is, is a company or an institution, assuming that we can make the discrimination, like a human being? Does it seek long life? So those are the three questions I'm going to answer and that's why I chose the title Institution Building and Corporate Ayurveda. If I stopped people on the road and said, uh, what does an institution conjure up in your mind? The answer that I have received is, uh, ah, the, the Red Fort is an institution. If you build a bungalow in golf links in uh, Delhi, that's not an institution. Taj Mahal is an institution, but if you go to the Kabristan, it's not an institution. Um, VT station is an institution, but Nasik station is a railway station. And this is good common sense. That's why I asked ordinary people. And... Um, the summary of it is that when you say the word institution to most people, it would mean something that's grand, it's awesome, it's long living. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the other things, uh, but uh, they are not grand, awesome and necessarily long living. So there's a huge difference in our minds between institution and what is not an institution. What is not an institution is not a bad thing. Most of us don't live in institutions. Not even a mental institution, not yet. So we live in ordinary houses, right? But in, none of us can say that it's a big institution. So why should we bother about this definition? Why should it engage our attention? Is it a pedantic? And you see, after 50 years of my career, when business is being bashed every morning, very often with good reason, by the way, for the various things that have happened. I ask myself, should one feel proud of having had a career of 50 years in business? Because if you meet a person who is an NGO, they think you are some sort of a crook. 
um, they look at you like that uh, and so on with various other sections of society even in your own family you'll have a brother or sister-in-law depending on their background who say you companies are rapacious people you're interested only in profit so if you look at an institution there are three types of players uh, if you look at a society there are three types of players there are those who defend there are those who advance and there are those who earn so that you can defend and advance what does defend mean if you join the army you join the police you're defending the nation or people's rights or whatever governments bureaucrats also defend it's like being half back in football you're not the goal scorer once in a while you may get the ball to kick but the center forward is the one who does that then there are those who advance society teachers scientists artists painters they improve the cultural and intellectual quality of what's happening in people's minds but business is the one that earns if business cannot earn then you can't have an army that defends or teachers who advance sorry and therefore while you may uh, in commenting commenting about these things crack a joke when people say that if desh ki seva karo come and join ias or army i said maine kuch kam desh ki seva nahi ki hai by joining a company where i have played a small role it's the company that has done it setting up new factories opening uh, new branches creating new jobs opening new avenues of business we have created jobs and if we don't create jobs and generate wealth pay the taxes then you won't have an army and you won't have teachers so i therefore want to restore for the purpose of today's talk and i won't have difficulty selling the idea to this crowd that business is also on a pedestal and i feel i have been no less a desh sevak as compared to somebody else and you may argue that one desh sevak is better than another that's a personal opinion so given that situation it is important just like you must have a good and honest army that you must have a good and honest business and business is conducted by companies <coughs> now when somebody is setting up a company a founder whether it is jamshed ji tata or mr godrej not this godrej but the ancestor or mr bajaj nobody sets up a company to see it die quickly it's like having a child in the family uh everybody says dirghaish so we want our company to live long so there are what i call centurion businesses tata is one godrej is one bajaj is one which have been around for 100 years unilever is one and you can study and many people have studied what has made them last 100 years and they try to chronicle their best practices i asked a different question i call them gen c companies like gen x and gen z and so on gen c companies centurion companies there are lots of lessons to learn sometimes the discourse or the narrative is that these old companies are all fuddy duddy and gone oh my god tata is a big bureaucracy godrej is like that bajaj is like that frankly they are giving you your roti and your dal uh, amongst others but there are what i call gen l companies also l meaning liberalization so instead of taking 100 year companies if you take 50 year companies which of them is worthy of being called an institution or looks like it will become an institution that's the question that was bothering me so in one of my uh, discussions i hope i've established to you that business as a whole and companies as a whole are very vital and important in social and economic growth and it is important to now discriminate amongst companies 
so that we can create an iconic standard not by getting awards in some um, awards function because as soon as they give an award within two years that company falls to the sword of some chartered accountant somewhere <laughs> and uh, it's actually dangerous to get an award and be on the front cover of a magazine because uh, you seem to something happens after that <clears throat> I'm talking of people who have survived and weathered all of that. Red Fort has survived, you know, 400 years. Uh, that's a very different thing from the building where you're living, where it starts leaking every time the monsoon comes. So there's a big difference. And it's nice to have more Red Forts, more Taj Mahals amongst the business community. That's my basic point. So if I've told you what is a institution and what's a institution building and why it is very important i would like to tell you a little bit about the research project that i am involved with right now and this happened because i in uh, one day in uh, sp jain which is a very fine uh, management institute in bombay i was just sitting and chatting with the faculty and i said what is the difference between an institution and a company and various people said various things as you can well imagine and uh, the debate went on. When you put five academics into a room, you'll get 50 different opinions, which is all a positive thing. <clears throat> and we said, can't we do something about finding out? And we undertook a journey. And the journey is now coming to a certain, uh, a certain uh, logical end. And I just want to briefly tell you what it is, because that is what is the theme and the subject of what I was going to talk about. I said, you people are all academics with PhDs. I'm not. So can you study all the existing literature and find out what academics have said about institutions? And sure enough, they were very good at this kind of stuff. They researched it because Indian management research is rather thin. And one of the things I'm trying to do is uh, let's research, uh, not just keep quoting American uh, examples all the time. And so we got a body of knowledge, which we then analyzed and classified. And uh, it told us what is the definition of an institution. I'm not going to go into all that in any detail now. And then we said, I want to look at things that look like they have an institution. So if I say, who are the great batsmen of India? And you start with Polly Umriger or, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Sunil Gavaskar or somebody like that, you say, yeah, that's all well established. They are the equivalent of Gen C companies. They've done great. They are wonderful. Their track record is known. That they are great batsmen is known. The only debate left is whether Sachin Tendulkar is <laughs> greater than Don Bradman and you can have a debate on that. But if I come and say, who are the youngsters who are playing now who could become like that? That gives you a different challenge because then you like a selector or an expert in cricket, you have to look at various factors to make a prediction. In the same way, I want to look at companies and say, these are good companies and the way they are going about it, they could become institutions because it's not a prize. You know, you don't get an institution ratna medal at the end of it. And... Uh, I don't pretend that we did something greatly scientific with econometric measurements, but we did some good common sense and said it must pass the test of credibility. And so we said it must be a company that has grown well, it has created jobs, entered new industries, it must look like it's got long life, it must have a sense of ethics, which doesn't mean it is perfect, but it is not so imperfect that it's in the news all the time. or a regular visitor to NCLT. And do you know, we found it difficult to find more than six or seven. <coughs> my, one of my conditions was all of us have to agree on it. Because you can say X, you can say Y, you can have 100 like that. So, and uh, I want to tell you who are the I wrote to the CEOs of those companies, all of whom I know, and said, we are doing this research study. We would like to come and interview you and people in your company because we want to write. On the other side, I picked, I got a publisher called Rupa, 
who was India's largest publisher, who got very, they were originators of the idea also. And so we are going to bring out six books on six companies whom we have researched. And that will come out next year. The important thing is, who are the six? I'm not here to tell you, I'll tell you who are the six, that's not a secret, but why we selected X and not Y, that's not the debate today. We are not giving prizes, we are not saying that, tan -tan -tan, here's the award, that's not what it's about. But we are putting forth for a hypothesis that uh, there could be others, but what are these people doing which is of interest and from which we can learn? And other companies who want to become. So we found a distinction between an institution and an ordinary company. Ordinary company doesn't mean a bad company, by the way. A well-run, good company, but which is not quite an institution. That was the distinction. A good batsman, he plays Ranji Trophy, but he is not quite in the league of... Uh... We wrote to them and then six of them agreed to participate in this research project. The six that we selected, is there press over here? No press, so this won't, not that the Economic Times is waiting to publish this, but uh, it's, online. Uh, it's online. But I don't mind saying which are the six, uh, it's unlikely to make the headlines tomorrow. Um, one is uh, Biocon, Biocon group of companies. The second is Marico. And the third one is Kotak Bank. The fourth one is HDFC Group. I'm not talking of the bank alone, but the bunch of institutions. The fifth one is Larson and Tubro. And the sixth one is uh, um, Tata Consultancy Service. Now, are there more? I'm sure there are more. And this research project can continue. So anybody left out doesn't mean that He's out of it. But I'll tell you the six we selected through an imperfect process. All of these are imperfect processes. And uh, I found that we found my the six academics who agreed to co-author the books with me. So there are going to be six books, one on each. And it's about the institution and not the, uh, the iconic leader that they've had. Because there are too many books about the iconic leader and his contribution that he's after... Uh, God created Manu, he created people like them. That's not the nature of the book that we are writing. These companies together have accounted for 2 million direct jobs, 10 million indirect jobs. And the market capitalization, which is about 30% or 20% of the BSE total market cap. BSE total market cap on a particular day when I asked for the information was 140 lakh crores. And these companies alone were 30 lakh crores. So they are not a <coughs> insignificant part. I've left out Hindustan levers and Tata Steel and so on for the reason that they are Gen C companies. So we had a five-step process. The first is literature search, which I've discussed already. The second is we had to have a hypothesis. In research project, you have a hypothesis, then you go and get the data to see whether it fits. And out of all that academic research that was done by my colleagues, we found something which we have now branded, I don't think I would say IP, that's too, too, too big a word for it, as the MBA grid. MBA doesn't stand for Master of Business Administration, it stands for Mindset, Behavior and Action. There's a Mindset, Behavior, Action grid. And what the literature told us was the people who build institutions, I don't want, I didn't want to keep calling them IB, so I use the word shaper because that's a more expressive word. People who build institutions, I've called shapers. So I'll use the word shaper and the other one I'll call a leader. He runs a good company. Maybe a bad company, in which case there's nothing to discuss for us. The difference between a shaper and a leader and what is it that he does it is not about the individual has he institutionalized it even after he's gone will it happen now in the case of a Tata Steel or a levers you can say they've been around 100 years they've had at least 10 different CEOs they have been able to institution here you may say we'll have to see what happens 
but uh, we are not judging people. So we put down and said there seems to be a good possibility that um, they will have successes. Then we went to the companies and we had this MBA grid in front of us and we populated it through the data. So it's very much like having a risk management framework to use your language and then going and finding out what are the risks and then putting it, classifying it into high risk, low risk, probability of happening, all that stuff. And uh, then we put together our research findings and we are going to convert it into six books, which will say this is what they do. <laughs> so I'm deliberately not using charts because the whole day we keep seeing charts and they dull the brain, uh, in my opinion. Just imagine an x-axis where you put three levels of management. Levels meaning not that way, but three types of... One is a manager. A manager is a person who takes instructions and carries it out efficiently. That's what you do for the first five, ten years of your career anyway. Then you may become a leader. That's the next step. And the leader is a person who puts together conflicting functions, finance, marketing, technical, and tries to run a company. And then comes a shaper who is really building a lal kila and not just another little building. So there's manager, leader, and shaper. All of them are necessary. You start your life as a manager, you become a leader, you, some of them become a shaper. And on the y-axis, we have put the three types of activities that these people do. A manager is usually intervening. There's a problem, he tries to help to solve it. You need a new distributor, he intervenes and he tries to appoint a distributor. The next level after the intervening level is uh, uh, resolving conflict so he's a conflict resolution and then the third one is actually anticipating now you got anticipate conflict resolution intervening and this way you got manager leader and shaper now think of the shaper and anticipation nine nine position that's the guy we are talking about a competent company leader who's managing his company quite well resolving conflicts and moving ahead is also necessary and then a person a rookie is a manager who intervenes and solves problems so there is a pathway there and uh, I want to come to the result rather than keep telling you anyway the books will come out if I tell you everything now nobody will buy the book so you might as well <laughs> have a little commercial consideration but let me tell you what we found and I'm giving you just a jhalak we found it very, very interesting. I personally sat in on some of the interviews with Anil Nayak and Deepak Parekh and Uday Kotak. The job is not yet over. And I, unlike my academic colleague who is taking the notes, tape recording, transcribing, and because they are research oriented, I could sit back and relate it to 50 years of my career. And I found that there were eight uh, things, ingredients, Okay, some badam, some pista, some kaju, some raisins, some masala, some dud. And I want to tell you what the eight are. But what I found really interesting is all of them chose a different uh, combination. But three were common to everybody. They didn't use the words I'm using, by the way, because each one used it in different ways of uh, talking. So let me tell you what are these ingredients. The first is what I call people relations. You, I'm taking chartered accountants far away from the otherwise dull and boring life that you have. I hope, I hope it's okay, Mr. President. Tell say, na? I have a chartered accountant colleague called Arun Gandhi. He said, "What are you doing in Bombay Chartered Accountants?" So as though, ye Dalit aadmi kaha gaya hamare mandir mein, you know? No, I shouldn't say that. I withdraw that comment. Please exorcise it because it's a sensitive subject to put it that way. I don't want to inadvertently offend. Uh, 
By people relations, I mean you're very respectful to others. Respectful, whether it's employees, distributors, shareholders, other people in your society, stakeholders, etc. You're also very cognizant of talent recognition. You spend a lot of time and talent. I was very struck that of these six people whom we interviewed, they gave numbers ranging from 25% to 40% of their time spent on people. Which is quite a high number. Quite a high number. And when I probed, when we probed to find out uh, what is 25 to 40%, they said it's not that my whole day my only HR department papers are coming. HR is not equal to people, necessarily. It is where I spend my time. And what am I thinking about when my car, I'm driving in my car? Okay? I'm thinking about what did he mean by that? Will this person make a suitable vice president, general manager, chief financial officer, etc.? People. So that's number one. The second is a remarkable ability to do short term and long term at the same time. So these are not people who say, Are yaar, ye business karte karte. I don't get the time to think of the long term. By the time you finish with the auditors and the regulators, there's no time to do anything else. This is in a, in a lighthearted jest, you may say that, but a CEO who's just spending his time with auditors, he's got a problem anyway. You must spend some time with auditors, but there are other things to be done. And the ability to deal with short and long term, simultaneously, without sacrificing. So you're always got a vision of where this company, a trajectory, where it's going. But you're dealing with the fires that are on your path. So it's much like saying, I want to go to the United States to go and see my grandchildren. But I have to get a visa. I have to go and get my passport updated. I have to get foreign exchange, etc., etc., which is a nuisance. Produce my Aadhaar card, uh, PAN card, etc. But I'm thinking that when I get to wherever, uh, how lovely it will be to take my grandchildren to the park or whatever. So you're thinking of long term and short term simultaneously. The third is an expression which we have created. I don't know if you have created, but which we have used called critical thinking. And by that we mean very often managements, managers and leaders will come to you and say, boss, this has happened. We have option A and option B. And uh, the shaper is unique in asking, well, why not C and D? And people will say, yeah, I never thought of that. A very good example of critical thinking is Sharad Pawar. <laughs> 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 uh, and you have seen in the last two days, uh, you still can't figure out. Right? But it looked like there's option A and option B. But somehow, some option C and D has also arrived. So, uh, it's a very important attribute. So, one person said, for example, when uh, this came, uh, people said you have to choose A or B. He says A, he says B, he says A, B. And she said, you're all looking into the problem. Stand back and say, what is this problem a part of? And you may get a different answer. And sure enough, they came with C and D. So I think it's a very important skill. Our whole training is analytical. Whether you're an accountant or an engineer, the moment I give you something, you'll tear it apart and find out what's in it. But if I say, but sit back. And say, what is this a part of? I can look at this earth. I can say, if you dig the ground, it's so much. It is round in shape. It has got so much depth. I can keep on analyzing. But I say, what is this Earth a part of? Oh, it's part of a galaxy. What is a galaxy? So it's a planetary system. I get a very different picture of Mother Earth when I look at it as part of a planetary system, as distinct from a geological approach, ki skandar, uh, mithi hai, pani hai, you know, all that stuff. That's the sort of distinction I'm making. So that is the third. Fourth is orbit changing. They're not only looking for solutions, but they're looking for what will change the trajectory of the institution or the company that they are heading. The fifth one is called breaking barriers. If you want to build a company, you'll have a lot of barriers. 
But if you want to build an institution, you have to break the barriers without sinking the boat. Sinking the boat, I mean, anybody can do it there. Then, identifying levers of change. So it's like a cockpit. I've got A, B, C, and D. When I should use my clutch pedal, when I should change my gear, when I should use speed, all those are choices to be made. And there's the seventh one is stakeholder orientation. Whenever somebody comes and says, if you do A and B, then we can save so much cost, he says, but what is the cost of the cost? And are we harming? Are we polluting the water? Are we denying jobs to people? Are we just become so they understand the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. They are not the same. Efficiency and effectiveness is not the same. So the last one is cyclical learning. They are not people who sit down and keep making uh, plans and speeches and strategies. They are people who go and act. It doesn't work, they'll try something else. They'll act, do, learn, act, do, learn, act, do, learn. So we got these eight. But of the three, of the eight, three were common to everybody. The first three, people relations, short versus long term, and critical thinking. And I was very struck by the manner in which these uh, six people expressed. Not only the six, but other people in there, because we went and interviewed other people as well. And I think we got a very good uh, sense of what the subject is, what does institution building mean, and of course we have ended with a grid, which is like saying, uh, if you want to build your company into an institution, what are the kind of things you can consider? We are not given any, it's not a McDonald's hamburger that you just take it and do this and it will work, but um, what you should be thinking about and how you can do it. And when the books are out, When the books are out, I'm not talking of individual companies and so on because really it's not proper at this point of time. But when the books are out, it will, and you get a different type. You get a dosa, you get an uttapam, you get a, you know, they're all looking around and pancake, but uh, they're all different. You'll get a chance to sit, if you're the CEO of a company, and we want to develop management training courses because all our MBA courses, train people to manage. You must have goals, you must have this, you must have that. So they can keep the gadi moving. They don't train shapers. And the people who need to be trained as shapers <coughs> are not 23 or 24 year old people who just finished their engineering or accountancy. They must be 30, 44, 40, 30, 40 years old who have worked for 10, 15 years and you know those you want to become field marshal, you don't choose Karakwasla to do it. You do it at a certain stage later on. So that's the uh, very interesting, and if I may say so, somewhat uh, distinctive project. At least I feel it's distinctive, which we are engaged with now. And I would hope that next year at this time. Uh, the books will be out and somebody would have said this is the biggest load of rubbish and somebody would have said that's a very interesting contribution. But we can all think about institution building. And uh, I would like very much that whether you're a chartered, I mean chartered accountants, people who say, ah, he's just doing all this khata work. No, it's not that. Chartered accountants are a method or an auditor is a way to build an institution. I always tell people that you don't like discussions on risk and control. If I ask you to jump from the plane, you want to be sure your parachute opens, right? So the parachute maker is worth something. If you say he's just a parachute maker, I'm the guy who jumps. Well, if he didn't do his job, <laughs> you know, you have, you'll have a problem. I always say the stronger and better the auditor, the more company can be shaped because you can take your risk. The auditor is helping you to shape your institution. And it's a slight repositioning and it's, it's a mindset change that you need. And this is very important, this mindset, behavior and action, these three steps. Because if I am deeply within myself having a certain mindset, for example, 
<laughs> if I am prejudiced about sex or gender, uh, then every time I see a person of that particular gender, I will immediately say it's not suitable. If uh, the company has to pay the maternity benefit, I say why take young people who are at that stage, take people who finish with their family building. These are all mindsets. We are not even conscious of it. And that results in a certain type of behavior and your actions come out of behavior. I think we'll have no difficulty in accepting this. What we are trying to do is to take the actions and then look at the behavior and then predict the mindset. So it's a counter current distillation column as a chemist, chemical engineer would say. And so we are reverse engineering it. If you, many books tell you what action you should take. It will say you must be clear and focused. You must, he says, but what can I do? He says, you must resolve conflicts efficiently. He says, but what shall I do? My marketing director and my financial director are fighting. They are not there to tell you what to do, but how do you get the mindset and the alignment? So, I would leave that subject and uh, say a few words about what I've called corporate Ayurveda. And uh, then I will um, stop. Now, you all know what Ayurveda means. It's the science of life. And uh, our country in particular is famous for this uh, great gift to mankind. And uh, it's all about a healthy lifestyle. And basically, I'm not an expert on Ayurveda, but it basically tells a human being um, what is it that you must do if you want to have a long life. And it says that you must keep your wind, your bile and your phlegm in balance. And then if you go to an Ayurvedic doctor, he will ask you various questions, as a result of which he will try to get this uh, things in balance. Now, I, any person's future is determined by three factors. Inherited genes. You can't do much about it. But that's only 15-20%, maybe 25% of who you are. Just because your father had heart problem or blood pressure or cancer, it doesn't mean you'll also get it. Much more depends on how you lead your life. We all know this, but it's good to remember these things and recall them. Improper diet, lifestyle, etc. They disturb the balance of the elements. And the third one is negative thinking. Now, I wrote an article in the newspaper, I get letters to the editor, I get people who write back. There are some people who say, all independent directors are bad. All businessmen are crooks. Abhi, I don't know how to, I can't engage in a discussion with that person. I said, it's your opinion uh, and your entitled to your opinion. He said, this is the trouble with people like you. He's telling me. He said, this is the trouble with people like you because you're not willing to engage in a debate. On email, to have a discussion, <laughs> every director is a crook. No independent director is independent. I don't know how to do it without getting uh, uncivil. And I, why should I spend my time? So I consider that negative thinking. He might have had some experience which has caused him to come to the view. Let it be. So what, is, what, what this means in terms is your mind, your soul and your energy are all in balance. Now I apply this to society. I said it's the same principle of Ayurveda apply it to society. And if you apply it to society, then you find there are three E's that come up. Energy, which is provided by business, for the reason that I mentioned earlier this evening. The whole, why is Bombay pulsating? Bombay is pulsating because whether you are selling chana on the um, light crossing of, uh, or you are a dabba wala who is carrying dabba at the train, it's pulsating. Everybody is busy here. They are, in fact, too busy. But you go to certain other cities, and I won't be undiplomatic, they seem to have a lot of time, five guys hanging around a tea shop. And you know economically, one has got energy and one doesn't have energy. So that's the first uh, and most important uh, aspect of an economy when you apply the principles of Ayurveda. The second is... Uh, the practices in the company, the equivalent of mind, how people are working. 
<coughs> and I call that the cultural advancement. I called it education for lack of a better word. Are people being trained? Are people being given new jobs to do? Are they being refreshed? Or are they doing the same job for the last 35 years? Then you are going to reach a certain level of stagnation. And the third E, energy, education, is eudomania. Now, this is the only one that requires explanation because it's a Greek word. Uh, eudomania is a very nice Greek word which means a feeling of being well. And you need a society to have eudomania. Uh, no negative thoughts, positive thoughts. What happens to you on Sunday if you have gone to the Jain Mandir or the uh, Pravachan or whatever, you know, you feel good. The Monday morning again, everything gets disturbed. <laughs> so, this is the secret for a company to have long life. Just like it's a secret for a human being to have long life. We all know the secrets, but we don't practice them. So, uh, I started to study um, with somebody else. And here's what I came to about how to create a long living company. Manage stress. Now, this looks like a good human being. Huh? Uh, sorry, for human beings, these are the manage stress rather than get overwhelmed by stress. The second one, this is Ayurveda. Huh? Meditate and calm your mind. Nothing new. Huh? I'm telling you nothing which you don't know. I'm just putting it into bullet points. The third one is maintain relationships and friendships. We don't know how much it contributes to our... So that's why in a building society, a cooperative building society is a unique agglomeration of uncooperative people. The Bombay Cooperative Society Act should redefine it. That when uncooperative people get together into the same premises, we will call it a cooperative society. Because people, you won't know if your neighbor died, <laughs> unless she or he died in the lift. <laughs> you say, I am chala gaya, you know. Um, do something but for the community and for others, not only for yourself. And the last one is earn enough but not too much. This is, uh, I don't know what you're going to do. Nowadays they calculate everything in billions. We don't have to come to you must have enough to, and be happy, because at a certain point of time, in the US, they've established that if you have more than seventy-five to $100,000 per annum income, you start going into the zone of unhealthy. If I multiply $100,000, it comes to 50 lakhs, 60 lakhs. You want to make it a crore, fine. You want to earn six crores for three years, and then you'll have nothing to do. If your nature of your job is like that, if you're a sportsman or a film artist, that's fine. But if you have much more than that, you start to... And I've actually written a book on this called Crash, which is published by Penguin, where I've shown that having too much of it, of power, actually damages your brain, which is the one that's reviewed in your BCAS book. So I went, my co-author and I, in another book that we are writing, went and said, surely somebody has studied this. What has it found? And I've got a library in my house which is called Long Life Companies. That's what gave me the idea. One is written by Japanese on Japanese long life companies. Second is written by Europeans on Europe's long life companies. The third is written by Americans on America's long life company. I said, is there a book on Indian long life companies and what we can learn? There is one on Tata, there is one on Godrej, there is one on Bajaj. And many of them turn out to be commissioned by that company, so it's sort of uh, written in a particular way. But what is interesting is what is the principle of long life. And here I want to tell you the mantra. The Japanese research book says, clear values and mission. And I think this is an opportunity for chartered accountants. Why chartered accountants? Because if you're working for a company and I'm talking of the professional accountant not the internal financial manager you have a chance to observe these things and I think it's an additional service other than tax audit and yeah, this audit that audit uh, to bring a managerial perspective to the data you collected out of your audit exercise 
and it is not statutory don't tell the companies act or sebi because then they will make it mandatory just <laughs> give it as an additional service even don't charge a fee and say this is our opinion if you don't like it reject it so kukat mein deta hai that's how you build up a business in the practice because i would hope in 20 years time every decent chartered accountancy firm can offer this service and hopefully at that time for a fee are you following long life practices in your company first a clear values and mission over a long period of time second a strategic and a long term approach this is the japanese company secret third focus on human beings and merit system fifth socially minded and building the nation if you think of some of our long life companies even in bombay not far from here you'll start to see that Japanese companies and Indian companies are not different, and they need not be different. Very adaptive and innovative. Frugality in using resources. Frugality, not splashing it around, and cultivate culture and legacy. Japanese use the word culture to mean लोगों की तरक्की होनी चाहिए. I then looked at the European, and I've summarized it all, and I came to the conclusion that. Uh, there is a piece of work to be done here uh, in spreading the ayurvedic mantra because it's exactly the same as in ayurveda you say that mind body and soul if you see a company where these are out of kilter people are fighting with each other they're not thinking long term they're thinking short term you go to a startup i <laughs> mean they're only thinking of valuation i mean perpetually and you know, how many more billion uh i don't know why they are worth 17 billion i haven't understood after 50 years of my career i feel like a dumbo when i see young people say, why have you started a company he says so oh, i can exit are why have you made a baby because i can marry her off and you know <laughs> it doesn't seem to make too much sense from a long term but then people say oh that's the trouble with you oldies and then i shut up you know so i would like to stop here i've shared with you some of the research and writings going on in the field of institution building and corporate i there are two sides of the same coin as it were those publications will be out next year but more importantly i wanted to leave you with the thought that if the bcas uh, uh, bcas uh, would like to adopt some of these as this material comes out i'll be very happy to help to promote Uh, the thinking behind it and maybe be enriched by what you all are doing thank you for having me over here i finished on time yeah we have time for a few question answers so i have a question you just mentioned that uh, the concept of uh, defenders advancers and earners so we as chartered accountants and advisors tax advisors to our clients in which category do we fall under and why you can choose your category frankly <laughs> uh, i think if you are helping owners or i told you not in so fact because i may get 100000 rupees as my salary but my cook who cooks for me and the people who work i consider them a part of it If my cook wasn't there, my servant wasn't cleaning. So, people who assist you are very much a part of the owner community. In my opinion, right? Advanced owner. Huh? Advanced owner. Well, so that's the answer to your sorry. <coughs> yeah, she Gracie has. Oh, <laughs> that depends on the auditor and what he has to say. He or she has to say. Who? No, when you say company, somebody has time. To... Well, frankly, well, this is the kind of sweeping statement where I have difficulty because uh, if the counter statement was made, then auditors are such bores. Don't see them at two o'clock in the afternoon. You'll go to sleep. that's not a good statement to make may i suggest 
that the way to look at it is when auditors have submitted their findings and report and is discussed are they acted upon and if they are not acted upon your comment can be taken as valid i may spend 2 hours with you as the ceo or my vice president of my company but if i don't do anything with it then you can you will not be happy all right no reply meaning you agree or well then i don't know why you are there as an auditor that's your call yeah <coughs> If nobody is interested in your service, then I think it's important for you to take a call. Uh, sir, in this yeah, uh, that's the most dangerous thing. Absolutely. If I may say so. Absolutely. If people just want a thappa from you and don't act on what you say, I don't know the competition amongst auditors for accounts and so on, but huh? I would not keep that account. Absolutely. If I had a choice. Luckily, I'm not an accountant. I don't have to make such a decision. Sir, in it's like a customer who doesn't want your shampoo or soap or software or whatever car. If no customer wants it, then what the hell are you doing? Sorry. So, in uh, institution building, of course, you emphasize that you know value systems and ethics they play a uh, major role. But what we find, you know, especially in case of uh, you know FMCG or other companies, the advertisement which they do. so do you think that you know companies are doing proper uh, because you know many advertisements are misleading to a great extent you know you must make the distinction between a personal opinion which has mixed in it a logic and a prejudice and everything put together and what the standards of advertising are there is a gentleman called mr mutalik he is a Vishwa Hindu Parishad or something in Mangalore. If a girl is talking to a boy, he thinks it's wrong. So he raids bars. Raids means he takes gundas with him into bars. And when if a girl and a boy are together dancing or having a drink, he gets them out. I don't think we should take that kind of an approach. Excuse me. Yeah. sir can you suggest some few names uh, after your uh, enough amount of time spent on research that ngos have become the institutions oh there are yeah. we did not study ngos yeah but there are ngos there are governmental institutions we mm. have not studied those okay so i'm not able to my one personal question i hope uh, president will yeah, allow yeah we have time so i think now i should be retiring from practice and whatever balance time that is available with me i must devote it to the society through some ngos so is it right way of doing or one should continue to uh, work till last and that also you said companies have become ngo uh, institution so please give your uh, expert sorry guidance. that's uh, it, this is a choice i don't know how that i can but i'll tell you what i have done okay i decided that i want to lead i'm not retiring i'm going to refire okay and just change one alphabet you get a very different meaning okay and refire to me because of my interest meant i'll indulge in myself in what i enjoy doing and which may be helpful writing speaking and teaching okay which is what i am doing okay now it's for you to decide yeah. what okay. you want to do yeah thank you sir thank you whatever you do don't sit at home just doing nothing if you can help it because your wife will get upset <laughs> good evening sir uh, mr gopal krishna thank you for this evening uh, my question is institution building uh, a fantastic perspective has come up we we'll look forward to your work in the form of the books but where is the core line when we talk about various bullet points which you discussed all all of us know but then where the core lies is does it lies with the directors of the company or the institution like i mean what tata sons has a module whether it lies with the the stake the promoters the the people the families or the people who have brought the company alive for a number of years where is this building process lies or is it if i can extend my question is it completely within the entire funnel of the organization thank you 
That's a good question. Um, in my view, if you're talking of institution builders, a certain mindset should have permeated. Whether it's come from a promoter or a director or from a founder, I don't know. But it should have permeated a large number of people so that it's automatically seen as the right thing to do. For example, I'll tell you, and I'm not talking politics uh, because it's a very touchy subject, but the concept of Vasudeva Kutumbam, everybody can live, we can all live together even if you are different, is a very strong Indian institutional inheritance. It didn't come from the promoter. Nobody can say Manu has written it. And if you look at India today, we are all inheritors of a philosophy which has been practiced for I don't know how many years. That's what I mean by, that's a very extreme example I've taken of an institution building. So when Jamshedji Tata said that the company is not different from the community, what the company has earned from the community, so it has to go back to the community, I call that institution building. And the way Tata has structured themselves through accident or design depends on your opinion. And Tata's are not perfect. Neither is Hindustan Lever, nor is Bajaj. Nobody is perfect. Periodically, you may have uh, some aberration. To be human is to be aberrant. But it is spread. And I can tell you that uh, the uh, total work done by the trusts and so on and so forth is uh, uh, something which is of great satisfaction to every employee. I go to work because I say, yeah, all this is going for some cancer hospital or some eye hospital or some good for somebody. That's what I mean by institution building. I hope I've answered your question. If you're looking for the wise words of one particular founder, which everybody will repeat, then you go to Delhi, you'll find it. <laughs> Typically, typically it will be a founder or somebody who has said why this institution is there. You can call it entrepreneur, it may be the founder, it may be a family, but it typically would have, it's like a seed. But the final plant or the tree has not been defined by them. But it's a continuous process of renewal. Absolutely. You, if one person's uh, uh, pet uh, subject, after that person is gone, it may not. But the ability to make it part of the institution for a very long time is what we are referring to. So you, you put your finger exactly where it uh, is important. Sir, uh, the six uh, companies which you named as uh, potential, uh, having great potential for being institutions. Now, I, what I noticed was the youngest amongst them was Biocon, which again is probably about two to uh, two and a half to three decades old. But some of them have been there for five, six, seven decades. So w when is the earliest time that you would normally spot uh, potential uh, institution? No, I have not taken from the date of birth. Okay. So Larson and Tubro, you could argue, has been there for... Yeah. 80, 80 plus, 60, 70, 80, 80, I think so, 80, 80 years. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking of people who around liberalization took off. Okay. Because pre-liberalization was a different regime and all of us know it, I don't need to describe it. So I'm talking of people who took off around the time of liberalization. And Larson and Tubro <laughs> took off much after that also, in the last 25 years only. At least that's the judgment we have come to. And I will respect other people who have an alternate viewpoint. 
how do you create perceptions because i feel sometimes two institutes uh, maybe the, on the same uh, level like but somehow one of them is perceived by society to be better than the other so how do you create perceptions about a particular organization you measure it suppose two organizations are almost uh, same identical or similar in many parameters but still societal perception of one is no no uh, but there is when you say suppose they are equal according to whom your opinion but my opinion may be different from yours the only way to judge perception is by measuring it when you say suppose two of them are identical according to whom whereas if i have a perception barometer and in brand building we do that all the time in tatas we do it all the time every 6 months we measure it so you must get up and then you may say your perception and this perception are equal then what's your question for some reason people perceive that company to be better than yours that's a reality remember there is no reality i'm not being mystical there is no reality there is only perception this world is full of perception now if you want to be philosophical you can say well our gurus have said this for the last several centuries if you want to be practical just read what's happened in bombay in maharashtra for the last two days <laughs> there is only perception who knows the reality so something you mentioned had a market cap you know sizable did you get a chance to look at any small or medium sized company as i told you we are just... we said who is I don't know what you mean by small or medium size. I mean, the market cap, you know, like I'm the total market cap of BSE is 140 Correct. lakh crores. We have chosen companies which come to 30. Okay. Correct. Now you could go on and select Should another select 20, 20 companies, 20, but you can't research 20, 20 more, or at least not at this first first stage. I'm sure there are. Okay. It is like saying India's most promising batsman. You can say I will look at the current Ranji Trophy players, <laughs> or you could go to the school. and we have not gone to the school thank you thank you uh, friends uh, just as a mark of our respect to the speaker i would just request you all to maintain 2 minutes uh, you know uh, patience uh, before leaving the hall friends i was sitting on the first row oh, and i got i thought i think 2 minutes silence no no <laughs> <laughs> i i got for memory tanda no, no no not at all okay friends uh, i was sitting on the first row and this is one observation which i made which i definitely want to make a point that when i was seeing the papers that he was turning i saw that he was using used papers so you can see the concern that he has not only you know for the environment but the way you know the his uh, uh, leadership qualities are there so this i wanted to point uh, put the point forward uh sir um, it gives me great pleasure to mention that you know you mentioned your bullet points on uh, the uh, ayurveda or the success points and if you see our annual plan a lot of points are coincidental if you see our include a uh, 5g which is our annual plan five distinct areas for the growth of our members one is the inclusive growth equal opportunities for all chartered accountants and it actually it means you know i mean inclusive growth all put together second also sustainable growth which talks about essence of the values and last and the most important thing is the human relationship that you talk about because eq growth is also one of our thrust areas and we at bca always look at all round growth rather than only economic or dynamic growth which is just to do with technology so may with, I, may i add a small comment sure, to you sure sure it uh, you you make a very interesting and valid point when we finished this initial exercise i said have you come to something unique and the answer is no is it unknown to mankind the answer is just known for a long time we know that our human body has phosphorus calcium zinc you know? if i put all this into a tawa and mix it i will not create a human being in nature in biology this is called the theory of emergence that it's not enough to have the ingredients but you must be able to bring them together into a life to convert them. that's where institutions suffer or companies suffer or large organizations including b b bca correct 
the ability of shapers to bring when a mother delivers a baby i mean it it doesn't go by the laws of physics right. she can't explain what happened but a marvel is created that's what a shaper is correct i hope bcas will do the same absolutely in fact sir it would be you know happy to i mean to learn i mean that our society itself is like an institution over the past 70 years we have our past president pranay bhai over here not a single time any you know uh, leader has been chosen with an election so far there has been never an election only on consensus and on merit we grow all you know so our actually you know i was just going to uh, conclude by saying that only that if you had get time maybe we could sit parallelly and maybe your next next publication could be on uh, bc as our as an institution uh, thank you uh friends i also acknowledge the presence of chaya here she is the uh, 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 president of the bombay management association and i would just request her to hand over as a bca tradition our instant i won't call it memory but an instant photograph <laughs> to our speaker yeah chaya please come <laughs> today's session photograph to the speaker I'll just request Mehir, our secretary, to briefly make certain announcement and then propose a word of thanks. Thank you. Before I give the well-deserving vote of thanks, a few announcements on the forthcoming events. <clears throat> on Friday, the 13th December, we have a full-day seminar on estate planning. wills and family settlement at uh, walchan hirachan hall uh, that's a paid seminar on friday the 13th december we also have a workshop on nbfc at orchid hotel that's also a paid workshop then there is a 20th dtta which is a ongoing course from 13th of december till 25th of january and which is going to be conducted at the bcs conference hall and of course there is a flagship event of uh, 53rd rrc which i would request all of you if you all have not registered please do register it starts from 9 january till 20 12 january at uh, tirupati where you have an added advantage of darshan for your good practice coming to the very honorable task of giving word of thanks to this extremely prominent and great speaker sir i can only be reminded of a statement that i had read somewhere that institutionalizing the dream is the first step towards its fulfillment but building and sustaining this institution is the real hallmark of success and many times we miss what as sir rightly said a difference between that company and the institution the company which exists to become institution what it would have gone through was so well elucidated by him and there comes time in the in the life of an entrepreneur in the life of a company which is that defining moment which makes it as an institution for future because the entrepreneurs and its whole team which he has really fueled them with that ultimate relation with the objective because if you ask a right entrepreneur he just does not do this for money he does this for the passion and he has related it to that larger objective tata steel did not just make steel tata steel's objective was that he wanted to build nation because jamshed ji tata thought that if english are ruling we are not going to be just building our nation we need to build our nation for our benefit and so would be the case henry ford did not just decide to start the manufacturing of cars he thought of roads and that's how he built those roads to make his cars travel across the entire country and made 
the institution out of his company. And once the institution is made, you need to sustain it. And how well, sir, you have elucidated by giving an example of corporate Ayurveda. And as you rightly said, it looks now so simple. It is all there. But we only need to relate it. Thank you so much for being here, sir. And we will look forward to leveraging your knowledge and experience time and again. Thank you so much.